It was July the 25th, 2000, and the unthinkable had happened. The world's most prestigious aircraft crashes. More than 100 people are dead. I couldn't believe it, because you, you can't, it couldn't crash. It was too magical to crash. Do you know what I mean? It sounds childish, but in your mind, it was just forever. And to think people that died, it, it was just dreadful. According to Air France, of the 100 passengers, two were Danish, one was a US citizen, the rest were German. The crash at Gornes shocked the world. Now every detail of the final moments of Flight 4590 was scrutinized. It was a crash that was a classic aircraft accident. It was a whole series of events, and it was the cumulative effect of each of the errors in this error chain that led to the final overwhelming catastrophe. It was a hot July day in Paris and the Air France Concorde was on a charter flight taking a, a hundred passengers to New York to join a cruise ship. It was fully laden. The airplane had been overfueled, all the fuel tanks and the wing had been filled up completely full. 19 items of baggage were put in the rear cargo hold which were never weighed. The net result of all this was that the airplane was over the maximum structural weight. They were running late, so there was a lot of pressure on the crew to taxi out and take off as quickly as possible and to get to New York non-stop. By the time it had got to the runway threshold, it had only burnt 800 kilos of the 2,000 kilos of taxi fuel that he had allowed for. And what he should have done was to have burned off all that taxi fuel before he got airborne. As they went down the runway, the airplane encountered a piece of metal, a piece of metal lying on the runway that had come off a Continental Airlines DZ-10. There was a piece of metal left on the runway, but there were also maintenance errors on the part of Air France. In the left-hand undercarriage, which had been worked on by Air France a couple of days before the crash, they'd failed to put back in there a component called the spacer. Without that spacer, the wheels could wobble around like wheels on a supermarket trolley. The tire encountered the piece of metal when the airplane was traveling at 185 miles an hour as the piece of metal cuts in. But it didn't puncture the tire in a conventional way. What it did was scalp the tire. That flew up and hit the underside of the airplane with a tremendous amount of energy. It set up a shock wave in that fuel tank. There was no airspace in the fuel tank to absorb the energy of that shock wave. It blew out a piece of metal, not a rupture from inside to out, but a mini explosion from inside and out came 100 litres a second of fuel. A really massive fire generating a lot of smoke and a lot of unburned fuel, which goes into the engines. The fire warning went off for the number two engine and the flight engineer, without any discussion with the captain or the first officer at all, just went straight into a fire drill and shut that engine down. The pilot rotated the aircraft 15 knots early to try and climb away. It went off to the left-hand side of the runway, hit a runway light before getting airborne. Sadly, staggered into the air. It never remotely reached its in-flight safety speed, which was 220 knots. They tried to climb away, got to about 200 feet, but couldn't climb anymore. But the real damage was done. The real damage was this massive fire. This dreadful blowtorch of fuel, flaming fuel pouring out of tank number five causing the center of gravity to move further rearwards. And this led to the airplane just rearing up. And once that had happened, really sadly, the airplane and all those on board were doomed. It was an accident that should never, ever have happened. The official French crash report concluded that the piece of metal on the runway had exposed vulnerabilities to Concorde's fuel tanks and tires. Air France and British Airways grounded their aircraft while expensive safety modifications were made. They were relaunched in November 2001, but the world had moved on. Two months before, the attacks on New York's Twin Towers had claimed 2,700 lives. Air travel lost its appeal and demand for business flights into New York plummeted. Concorde was crossing the Atlantic 
almost completely empty. Added to that, maintenance costs were soaring. And so in April 2003, Concorde's retirement was announced. It's the end for Concorde after 30 years of supersonic flying. British Airways and Air France will retire the plane in six months' time. And it was a shame, like, you know, when you heard the story that um, it was going to be taken out of service. That was, what a bad day that was. That was horrible. Nobody, nobody liked that at all. Over the next six months, there was a rush to take a last flight on Concorde. Every seat was sold and more flights were added. Then a grand tour of the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom. Finally, on the 24th of October, 2003, flight 002 left New York for the last time. So, we're just about to set course, and the acceleration on the runway is quite something to remember, as I'm sure will be the rest of the flight. It was done with a lot of press hullabaloo, as you can imagine. It's a big, important day. But on board the aircraft, the top celebrities <laughs> and the big red-faced newspaper editors and TV presenter-type people on board spent their time, as far as I could see, getting drunk. There were a lot of celebrities, and among them was Piers Morgan and Jeremy Clarkson, who had a fight and they were throwing glasses of water at each other like great overgrown schoolboys. This machine, if you could have seen it flying through the sky, I mean, staggeringly fast, just a this thing going, never lost its beauty, its poise, its composure, and inside the very last flight. It was, I think, so rough and drunken and awful. First one Concorde, then another, a sight never seen before, three in all waiting to land. As we came down, we saw tons and tons of people all waving and shouting and with flags and banners. And all of the fire engines from Heathrow had their hoses on and they were spraying water all over Concorde as it landed. It was very, very moving because it was like, it was totally the end of an era. It was the end of an era. The end of the reception, about 10.30 at night, I walked out across the tarmac, I was the last to leave, and there were five perfectly serviceable Concords sitting on the ramp, and they would never carry fare-paying passengers again. And that's the time when it really hit me, and that's the time when there was a, actually literally a tear in the eye. The end of Concorde felt to many as though the supersonic dream was over. Very sad that Concorde was retired in 2003 with no obvious successor. It was the first time in aeronautical or perhaps technological history that we'd actually taken a step backwards and we'd just gone back to subsonic aircraft. But in the last few years, a new race has begun with at least three aircraft in development. There's a company working on a 30 to 40 seat supersonic transport for businessmen. I think that could appear on the scene within the next five years. As far as a full-blooded supersonic airliner is concerned, I think we probably are going to have to wait a lot longer for that. And I think eventually we will see perhaps hypersonic suborbital vehicles that do London to Sydney in a matter of three hours, something of that sort, two and a half hours.